Hello everyone. It is Tuesday. It is December the 8th, I think, um, in this long year of, is it still March? Um, either way, it is uh, Tuesday. It is 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time and that means it's time for another episode of First Chapter Fun. I see I'm live on Instagram because I see um, Al and I see Take the Day Off to Read um, and I see Glennie has just joined. That's absolutely lovely. And I think I'm live. Yes, I'm live on Facebook as well. I see Ali and Carla and lots of people joining. Uh, Al says it is March 212th. Yes, that feels about right. I don't know why we we feel this. Oh my goodness, it's going to be 2021 as if as if as of the 1st of January, everything's suddenly going to change. Um, and everything's, you know, COVID and everything will just disappear. Shh, don't mention COVID on First Chapter Fun. This is this is our little bubble of happiness. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that uh, there is an end in sight, hopefully, to, to all this madness. But don't you worry, we are booking First Chapter Fun readings well into 2021 to make sure we keep you entertained and keep your to-be-read list out of control. I mean, basically, that's what Hank and I are doing. So, you know, just making sure we give you books to read uh, twice a week, every week. So how is everyone? I see Hank. Good morning, afternoon, mo afternoon, afternoon. Hank and Beth and Catherine. Uh, lots of comments already. Uh, Daisy says hello from Austin. Glennie, of course, is in San sunny San Diego. Lovely and sunny here too, but not very warm. Um, we went and got our Christmas tree on uh, on Saturday. We normally have a fake one, and I don't know how old it is. It's so, it's so old it's starting to look like a Charlie Brown tree. And we decided we were going to go out this year um, and and actually get one, do the whole family experience, and go out and and, and get a tree, a, a, a real one. Um, I still feel bad about that, you know, taking a live tree. But anyway. So we decided to do that and I was so excited and it's probably, I don't know, three and a half kilometers, couple of miles away from the house. But I got so excited because I'd really forgotten what it was like that far away, that far away from the house. Anyway, it's Tuesday. It's time for first chapter fun and it's lovely to see you all. Today is episode 114. Can you believe that? Episode 114. So if you have not seen an episode of First Chapter Fun before, first of all, welcome to this fabulous group. Twice a week we read here, my wonderful partner in crime, um, fictional crime. <laughs> Ooh, quick, add that in there. Hank, Philip Ryan and myself, Hannah Mary McKinnon, we read the first chapter of different books, other people's books, every Tuesday and every Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern and have been doing so since March. And all of the episodes are saved for your viewing pleasure. You can go back and watch every single episode to your heart's content because they are saved on our IGTV because I'm broadcasting on Instagram on my phone right here. And I am broadcasting on Facebook via my webcam up here. Who says we're not high tech, eh? Come on. So they are saved on Facebook under the videos tab. In the new Facebook, that is media and then videos. Um, and like I said, we have lots and lots of, of um, readings scheduled all the way into next year. Um, I just saw a comment now it's gone. Oh, Bren Brenda Gaskell on Facebook. She says, great interview on the Cuyahoga County Library Facebook last night, Hannah. Well, thank you very much. Our wonderful librarian, Jen Jumba, who I met in an underground parking, as you do. Um, we were both on our way to BoucherCon. BoucherCon is the annual murder, mystery, readers, writers convention. And we happened to meet in a parking. We've become friends. And yesterday um, I had the pleasure of chatting with her um, for about 45 minutes, which you will find on the Cuyahoga uh, County Library website. It was so much fun. But today, let me tell you, oh, <laughs> Robin says sparkly jumper. Yes, it's a sparkly jumper. And I've realized I don't have very many jumpers. 
sweaters, whatever you want to call it. But my sparkly jumper I'm wearing because today I am taking you to Iceland and I will get to that in a minute. But that is what I am doing. I'm taking you to Iceland. And so I thought I'd wear I'd wear a, a sparkly, slightly kind of blue, silvery, trying, I'm channeling my inner frozen, okay? It's trying to make it snow-like. Anyway, I've probably spoiled it now and taken the fun out of it by explaining what I was trying to do. But I am absolutely delighted to see that today's author, Urza Sigurdotter, is here. I see her on Instagram. She says, hello, everyone. I am totally low tech, but trying. Ah, but you're here, Urza, which is absolutely fabulous. So let me introduce you to today's book by showing you the cover. So this is today's book. The Legacy by Urza Sigurdardotte. Don't make me say that too often. I'm pretty sure my German uh, roots and origins are helping me, but I hope I hope I pronounced your name properly, Urza. I'm so sorry if I didn't, if I butchered it a little bit. I was practicing. Um, my maiden name was Alpplanalp, Swiss. Nobody can spell it, even the Swiss. If you go outside of the Bernese uh, region, uh, Bernese Oberland, where I where I'm from. And no one could pronounce it. So I know how frustrating it is when people can't say your name. But this is the book, all focus on Ursa Sola Dotto. This is the book we're reading from, The Legacy. And I'm so excited to bring you this. Um, at BoucherCon, the Murder Mystery Readers, Writers Convention. Let me see now. Um, I don't think it was last year. Was it last year or the year before? Uh, either way, we have panels at BoucherCon where you have different authors and we're talking about, um, say, our, our writing process or how we build our characters or how we do research, um, how we kill off people, uh, that kind of, not real people, obviously. Um, and I was in the audience watching a panel that Ursa was on and I laughed so much. Ursa's sense of humor is absolutely brilliant. Uh, very dark, which was right up my street. And I laughed so much and we connected on social media afterwards. Uh, and now she's here with The Legacy. So I'm so excited to bring you this. So I'm going to introduce you to Ursa and tell you all about her. Now, because Ursa is watching, I'm not sure, I haven't seen her on Instagram and I was just having some trouble get, uh, getting onto Instagram. But please leave comments for her on uh, on Facebook so she can interact with you because she's she's here uh, and she can see you um, and she can answer your questions. Uh, oh, Ursa says no one here uses last names anyway. Oh, there you go. Well, we'll just stick with Ursa like like Cher or Madonna. Um, that won't fly with Hannah. I think there's just too many of us. Um, anyway. Let me introduce you to Ursa and I am going to put my glasses on because otherwise I can't see. All right. Ursa Sigurdardotter began her writing career by writing children's books, although she's best known for her contribution to crime fiction. And, and yes, I will get to that in a second because she's widely, widely known um, and, I'll, and I'll explain why and how. She is the author of the Thora series, crime novels featuring lawyer Thora Gorman's daughter, as well as the more recent series featuring policeman Holdar and child psychologist Freya. Ursa has won several Icelandic and international awards for her novels, The Legacy, which we're reading from today, being no exception. It was selected crime novel of the year upon publication in Iceland and also in Denmark. Ursa's crime novels have been successful internationally and have been translated into no less than 35 languages. An author's dream, let me tell you. Um, congratulations, Ursa, that is incredible. Ursa is a civil engineer by trade and still works as such in her native Iceland, where she lives with her family and pug. So, I'm always astounded. I, I, I do this writing gig full time. Um, I mean, I mentioned this before. I um, run the accounts, do the accounts for my husband's electrical company and, and, and manage three teens. <laughs> uh, I'm, the, I'm the, the CFO of the house and I mean um, chief flipping organiser. 
I don't always use flipping. Sometimes that word might be a bit ruder, depending on what's going on. Um, but I don't work full time. And I find that so fascinating. And I know a number of authors who are prolific in their writing and who also work full time. And I'm just astounded and in awe. Um, I find that absolutely amazing. It's incredible. So once again, the cover. You must get your hands on this. This is the um, first book in the series, as I mentioned. So The Legacy is the first. The Reckoning, which I have right here, is the second. Then we have The Absolution. That one is the third. You see that properly? Yes, you can. And the fourth one, which I don't have here, is Gallows Rock. And they are all out now. So not right now but once we're done you will be able to get your hands on the entire series of four books um, and read them all I mean you know the holidays are coming up it's time to binge read books people and this is your perfect series particularly if you like crime particularly if you like crime set in Iceland so without further ado let me read you um, the back cover copy of The Legacy. The first in a stunning new series from Ursa Sigurdardottir, the author of The Silence of the Sea, winner of the 2015 Petrona Award for Best Scandinavian Crime Novel. The Legacy is the first instalment in a fantastic new Icelandic series featuring the psychologist Freya and the police officer Huldar. The only person who might have the answers to a baffling murder case is the victim's seven-year-old daughter, found hiding in the room where her mother died. And she's not talking. Newly promoted, out of his depth, Detective Haldar turns to Freya for her expertise with traumatised young people. Freya, who distrusts the police in general, and Haldar in particular, isn't best pleased, but she's determined to keep little Margaret safe. It may prove tricky. The killer is leaving them strange clues, but can they crack the code? And how many more will die before they do? And if they do, will they be next? So of course we always read with the author's permission, Hank and I, and the publisher, Sir Ursa's permission in this case, and her wonderful publisher, St. Martin's Press. So get a load of that brilliant cover. See, I'm filling up the screen on Instagram anyway. Um, and let me read, I wish I would, it wasn't back to front on Instagram. Come on, Instagram, fix it. Um, but I'm now going to read you the opening pages. So sit back, relax, and listen to The Legacy by Ursa Sigurdardottir. Chapter One, Thursday. It takes Elisa a moment or two to work out where she is. She's lying on her side, the duvet tangled between her legs, the pillow creased under her cheek. It's dark in the room, but through the gap in the curtains, a star winks at her from the vastness of space. On the other side of the bed, the duvet is smooth and flat, the pillow undented. The silence is alien too, for all the times it has kept her lying irritably awake, she misses the sound of snoring, and she misses the warmth that radiates from her permanently superheated husband, which requires her to sleep with one leg sticking out from under the covers. Out of habit, she's adopted that position now, and she's cold. As she pulls the duvet over her again, she can feel the goose flesh on her legs. It reminds her of when Sigvaldi was on night shifts, only this time she's not expecting him home in the morning, yawning, hollow-eyed, smelling of the hospital. He won't be back from the conference for a week. When he kissed her goodbye at the central bus station yesterday, he had been more impatient than her to get their farewells over with. If she knows him, He'll come back reeking of new aftershave from Duty Free and she'll have to sleep with her nose in her elbow until she gets used to the smell. Although she misses him a little, 
The feeling is mingled with pleasure at the thought of a few days to herself. The prospect of evenings in sole command of the TV remote control, of not having to give in to the superior claims of football matches, evenings when she can make do with flatbread and cheese for supper and not have to listen to his stomach rumbling for the rest of the night. But a week's holiday from her husband has its downsides too. She'll be alone in charge of their three children, alone to cope with all that entails, waking them, getting them out of bed, dropping them off and picking them up, helping with their homework, keeping them entertained, monitoring their computer use, feeding them, bathing them, brushing their teeth, putting them to bed. Twice a week, Margaret has to be taken to ballet and Stefan and Bardor to karate, and she has to sit through their classes. This is one of the least rewarding tasks, as it forces her to face the fact that her offspring display neither talent for nor enjoyment of these hobbies, although they don't come cheap. As far as she can tell, her kids are bored, never in time with the rest, forever caught out facing the wrong way, gaping in red-cheeked astonishment at the others who always do everything right. Or perhaps it's the other way round. Perhaps her kids are the only ones getting it right. She waits for her drowsiness to recede, aware of the radioactive green glow of the alarm clock on the bedside table. She normally begins the day by hating it, but doesn't experience the usual longing to fling it across the room as the luminous numbers show that she's got several more hours to sleep. Her tired brain refuses to calculate exactly how many. A more important question is niggling at her. Why has she woken up? To avoid the fluorescent glare of the clock, Elisa turns over, only to choke back a scream when she makes out a dark figure standing by the bed. But it's only Margaret, her firstborn, the daughter who has always been a little out of step with other children, never really happy. So that's what woke her. Margaret, sweetie... Why aren't you asleep? she asks huskily, peering searchingly into her daughter's eyes. They appear black in the gloom. The mass of curly hair that frames her pale face is standing on end. The child clambers over the smooth duvet to Elisa's side. Bending down, she whispers, her hot breath tickling her mother's ear and smelling faintly of toothpaste. There's a man in there. Elisa sits up, her heart beat, her heart beating faster, though she knows there's nothing wrong. You were dreaming, darling. Remember what we talked about? The things you dream about aren't real. Dreams and reality are two different worlds. Ever since she was small, Margaret has suffered from nightmares. Her two brothers conk out the moment their heads hit the pillow, like their father, and don't stir until morning but the night seldom brings their sister this kind of peace. It's rare that Elisa and her husband aren't jolted awake by the girl's piercing screams. The doctor said she would grow out of it, but that was two years ago, and there's been little sign of improvement. The girl's wild locks swing to and fro as she shakes her head. I wasn't asleep. I was awake. She's still whispering and raises her finger to her lips as a sign that her mother should keep her voice down. I went for a wee and saw him. He's in the sitting room. We all get muddled sometimes. I know I do. Elisa breaks off mid-sentence. Shh. This is more for her own benefit. There's no sound from the hallway. She must have imagined it. The door is ajar, and she strains her eyes toward it, but can't see anything except darkness. Of course, who'd be there? Who'd be out there anyway? Their possessions are nothing special, and their badly painted house is unlikely to tempt burglars, though their home is one of the few in the street that doesn't have all its windows marked with stickers advertising a security system. Margaret bends down to her mother's ear again. I'm not mu 
startled. There's a man in the house. I saw him from the hall. The girl's low voice sounds wide awake, betraying no hint of sleepiness or confusion. Elisa switches on the bedside light and gropes for her mobile phone. Could her alarm clock have stopped? It's had to put up with all kinds of rough treatment over the years, and she's lost count of the times it's ended up on the floor. It's probably not worth putting Margaret back to bed. Probably time to start the morning chores, put out three bowls of buttermilk, shovel over some brown sugar, and hope she'll be given a chance to rinse the shampoo out of her hair while they're eating. But the phone's not on the bedside table or on the floor, though she could have sworn she'd brought it in with her last night before turning off the lights. She wanted it to hand in case Sigvaldi rang in the early hours to let her know he'd arrived safely. What time is it, Margaret? The girl had never wanted to be called Maga. I don't know. Margaret peered out into the dark hallway. Then, turning back, she whispers, Who comes round in the middle of the night? It can't be a nice man. No, it can't be anyone at all. Elisa can hear how unconvincing she sounds. What if the child's right and someone has broken in? She gets out of bed. Her toes curl up as they encounter the icy floor. All she's got on is one of Sigvaldi's t-shirts and her bare legs prickle with goose flesh again. Stay here. I'm going to check on things. When I come back, we won't have to worry any more, and we can go back to sleep. Agreed? Margaret nods. She pulls her mother's duvet up to her eyes. From under it, she mutters, Be careful. He's not a nice man. The words echo in Elisa's ears as she goes out into the hallway making an effort to appear unconcerned, confident that there's no intruder. But Margaret has sown a seed of doubt in her mind. Oh, why couldn't this have happened last night when Sigvaldi was home? Would that have been too much to ask? Elisa hugs herself against the cold, but it doesn't help. When she turns on the light, the brightness hurts her eyes. The door of the boys' room emits a faint creak as she looks in to check that they're sleeping peacefully. They're lying in their bunks, eyes closed, mouths open. She pulls the door quietly to behind her. There's no one in the bathroom. In Margaret's room, her gaze is met by a row of dolls and teddy bears lined up on a shelf. Their eyes seem to follow her as she hastily closes the door again. She wonders if this arrangement might explain Margaret's nightmares. Personally, if she woke up in the, in the night, she wouldn't want to be confronted by those rigid stares. In the gloom, there seems to be an air of malevolence behind their cuddliness. It might be worth moving them to see if that would help Margaret sleep any better. She'll do it after work this evening. There's nobody in the bedroom hallway or in the rooms opening off it. No sign of any mysterious intruder. But what was she expecting? Footprints? A cigarette butt on the floor? A broken flower pot in one corner? By the time she approaches the sitting room and kitchen, she's feeling much calmer. The illumination from the street lights is enough to convince her that it must have been another of Margaret's fantasies. The dark always sends one imagination into overdrive. Now she can see that there's no one in the sitting room, just the empty popcorn bowl in front of the television and swathes of Lego round the coffee table. Everything is exactly as it was when she went to bed. How silly to get in such a flap. The smile that curls her lips disappears abruptly from her face. The sliding door dividing the dining area from the kitchen has been pulled shut. But it's never shut. So if you don't have goosebumps, I I have them for you. <laughs> that was the opening. Oh, the chi oh, the chilling, chilling opening of the legacy by Ursa Sigurdardottir. How about that? How? Oh. Oh, still got those goosebumps, Ursa. That is just, that is incredible. It's so atmospheric. And you just know that it, it, 
you know, it's not going to end well, obviously, from from reading um, the the back cover jacket. But <laughs> Judy says, don't stop there. Shannon says, keep reading. Ali says, oh, no. Um, oh, yes. So as I mentioned, this is the first book in the series. So if you have not, Carla says, I am hooked. I must read this. Yes, you must. You must. And you can have four books to enjoy of Ursa's uh the legacy now this is the children's home series. is that right Ursa the children's home series I think um I think that's the name of the series and you can get your hands on every single one of them right now which both uh Hank and I think you absolutely should so um <laughs> lots and lots of uh, comments coming in definitely have to get this uh, says Lila and Beth says me too oh thank you so she says I, I read well you know it really is and we've said this before Hank and I uh, obviously we're not we're not um, um, professional narrators by any stretch of the imagination and it's such an honor always to read for for authors by the same token you don't want to mess it up you don't want to 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 read something how they hadn't imagined it um, so I'm glad, I'm glad it went well. Carla says, I am hooked. I must read this. Yes, yes, you must. Lots and lots of comments as well Oops, on Instagram. And now I can't see them properly. I'm just scrolling up. Uh, we see Tracy, uh, uh, Tracy Clark says, uh, LOL, Iceland. Um, wonderful. Yes, absolutely great to see all of your, all of your comments. I'm going to show you the cover again, The Legacy by Ursa Sigurdardotter. You must check it out and it's available now. So that was today's reading. What do we have in store for you on Thursday? Another thriller heavyweight, suspense heavyweight. We have Karen Dion's The Wicked Sister. Karen, of course, is the author of The Marsh King's Daughter. Huge success option for film slash TV, I believe. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if this one has, has, well, I wouldn't be surprised if it hasn't already been snapped up uh, or I wouldn't be surprised if it has already been snapped up just to make clear what I'm trying to say and clearly stumbling on. Not good with words today, which does not bode well because I'm writing um, this afternoon on uh, one of my books. So yes, let me show you that one again. If you just tuned in, make sure you watch the replay uh, to hear the opening pages of The Legacy by Ilse Sigurdardotter. And join us on Thursday for First Chapter Fun, of course, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time, as always, for Karen Dion's The Wicked Sister. We can't wait. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope that you will join us on Thursday as well. Stay warm if you're living anywhere close to where I am. Sun's out, but temperatures are down. And of course, as always, please, 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 please stay safe, stay kind, and we will see you on Thursday. Thank you so much for watching.